It is my pleasure to introduce our morning's keynote speaker, Dr. Dana Cuff. Dana engages spatial justice and cultural studies of architecture as a teacher, a scholar, a practitioner, and an activist. In 2006, Dana founded City Lab, a research and design center that initiates experimental projects to look beyond the boundaries of architecture and engage with the city and its users. City Lab represented the United States at the 2010 Venice Architecture Biennale and was named one of the top four urban think tanks in the country by Architect Magazine. The lab's housing first research demonstrates that affordable, well-designed housing in neighborhoods are attainable foundations of equitable cities. In 2017, after a decade of research that included a full-scale demonstration house built on the UCLA campus, Dana co-authored California State Legislation, effectively opening 8.1 million single-family lots for secondary rental units. Dana is a professor of architecture at UCLA, where she is also the leader of the Urban Humanities Initiative. She is the author and editor of numerous books, including Urban Humanities, New Practices for Reimagining the City, Fast Forward Urbanism with Roger Sherman, and most recently, Architectures of Spatial Justice. She received the Women in Architecture Activist of the Year in 2019 from Architectural Record, Researcher of the Year in 2019 from the Architectural Research Center's Consortium, and was named Educator of the Year in 2020 by the AIA LA. Join me in welcoming Professor, Author, and Activist Dana Cuff to the AWA Plus D Symposium stage to speak to us on the topic of transitions from architecture for spatial justice. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you to the AWA Plus D for inviting me to give this keynote address and thanks to all of you for coming out so early on a Saturday morning. And I wanna give special <laughs> thanks to ASU uh, first of all, for just restoring this amazing building, but also for inspiring my own chancellor at UCLA, who I have been trying to get to move to a facility downtown for years, and it was only seeing the bus go by that said ASU in LA that got him thinking, like, why aren't we also there? So, thanks, Duke. Um, now, Chad, I don't have any idea where you are, if you would just roll the first slides, and do I need to say next, or can I do that with this? Okay, let's see. Perfect. Thank you. I didn't hear Duke, but we're in my mind. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this to s close to 15 minutes so we have a little time for Q&A, because that's actually the most exciting part of giving a talk for me. Um, the idea that this is a conference about transitions seems totally appropriate in this time in architecture, and uh, I'm uh, committed to and hold deep convictions about ideas of social justice and the ways our DNA, uh, especially in a uh, women's architectural organization, but in architecture and its history, can really contribute to the advancement of social justice uh, wherever we work. So I'm gonna show you a few examples. I'm gonna talk about how I got to this point a little bit, and then I'm just gonna talk about a small portion of the book and focus particularly on housing since that's such an important issue here in Los Angeles. The book's cover has gotten a lot of press, and I'm really pleased about that. It's by the artist Jalen Gomez, who's hacked the David Hockney image that I think has characterized the way we've been associated with privilege in the past. A kind of simple modern box with the American collectors, Fred and Marsha Weissman, looking like they've already died and become one of their sculptures in a way. Um, but in Jalen Gomez's work, she points out who's actually maintaining and keeping that modern box looking as pristine as it does. And the man uh, on the front cover with his leaf blower, looks powerful, looks like he might be uh, ready to bring you into the house, looks like he might have a source of resistance there. And all of that together, I think, really embodies what I'm hoping uh, to get across as a kind of transition to an architecture that's more public and less privileged and less white. 
this is coming from someone who has a lot of privilege and is white, and I feel like it's my duty to use those uh, privileges in behalf of the kinds of people who have not been brought into architecture in the past. The idea that visual media can, in fact, inspire transformative change is at least goes back to Jacob Rees's understanding of what tenements were like in New York at the turn of the century. And he, through flash photography, showed us what was invisible prior to his uh, moving inside immigrant housing to show how um, deplorable the conditions were. And that photography was part of, an important part of what really transformed housing policy in New York at the time um, when the tenement laws came into place to bring more light and ventilation and facilities uh, and safety into what had otherwise been very unsafe and un inhospitable living conditions. So it's that kind of trajectory that Tracy referred to in the work we're doing at City Lab, and this is just my own transitions over the last 20 years in some ways, which began with a study of public housing here in Los Angeles with a book called The Provisional City. That helped spur Roger Sherman and myself, uh, Roger now works elsewhere, um, to found City Lab as a kind of alternative model, but a generative model of what might be possible in new forms of academic and research and practice um, collaborations. We then built the backyard home and did 10 years of research that led to legislation. I'll tell you about a little bit of new legislation that just passed and then just last month, actually April, the book came out that kind of summarizes both the work that we've done at City Lab, but the work that's being done all over the world. And I think that's an important acknowledgement. This is not something that originated at City Lab by any means. There are uh, all the offices that are represented here, all the architects represented here, have sparks of spatial justice in their work. And the goal for all of us is to expand that and to be able to advance spatial justice more consistently through our practices. So what do I mean by spatial justice? This really comes from the um, geographer Ed Soja, who studied Los Angeles and taught at UCLA when I first started there, that justice has a geography. The equitable distribution and access to housing, services, amenities, and a livable planet are basic human rights. Design and planning can counteract spatial injustice. Pretty basic, and I think we all have come to see this perspective as part of uh, the way we develop an ethics about our field. That's not something that we always spoke about in architecture school, as you all know, or maybe we don't speak about it enough in our practices. Just to show that this isn't um, only a phenomenon for the most vulnerable, it's kind of like preaching to the choir in Los Angeles. We all know how deeply the housing crisis affects all segments of the population, except maybe the William Randolph Hearst of the world. Um, it was our own graduate students at, in the UC system who recently successfully went on strike for higher wages, but their primary concern was their housing costs. That has produced a perverse architectural condition. I see some of you nodding. This is the windowless dorm for 3,500 students at UC Santa Barbara, which followed directly on the hills of a lot of press of students living in their cars, not enough dorms, living in uh, campgrounds. Obviously, unacceptable situation for those students. That we would be willing to accept, uh, you know, titan of industries, small contribution to the whole. I think he's giving 200 million, which sounds like a lot, but the whole project costs 1.6 billion um, to the UC system to build dorms that we would normally consider unlivable given that there's no light or air in the individual rooms. But we're pressed to think through these things seriously because of the depth of our housing crisis. So I just want to talk about these three imperatives or principles of spatial justice, of designing for spatial justice this morning, uh, that we need to leverage design to open paths to the world we want to live in, that we need to design generative projects, not singular solutions, and we do that 
to address moments of crisis. So there are other, these are each chapters that feature different architects and their work. Um, there are other principles that are in, in the book and you can go get a copy and I'll get my three cents uh, you know, <laughs> of royalties for that. So it's not that I'm earning anything on this. Um, all right, so leveraging design for change. I, to me, this is probably the most important imperative that we have as architects, and in a way, is to bridge the gap between the idea that it's privilege that deserves aesthetics and beauty and not the public, <laughs> and that somehow we've separated the idea of form and function and aesthetics and value or economy and, and we have not resisted that fully enough. And it's the design skills that we all hold that is gonna demonstrate that it's a public good to be able to assign joy and beauty and environmental goods to the architecture we create. So I'll talk a little bit about the Backyard Homes Project, which led to the ADU law. <laughs> not fast, though, there was 10 years of work that went into this. We always thought uh, at City Lab that we were gonna be changing the city council's vote so that we could build ADUs in Los Angeles. We were never successful with the city council, which is a longer story we can talk about later. But we, in uh, pursuing that goal, studied every aspect of backyards, basically, where we saw already uh, bottom-up practices of secondary units, granny flats, garage apartments happening even though people weren't getting economic benefit when they resold their property from that because they were illegal. So um, we started looking in Pacoima where there are huge lots. You could build three or four additional units in the back and many people had done so. Um, the DIY construction culture is one that we all know well here in Los Angeles and it was that kind of DIY culture that made my colleagues say to me when I was beginning this research, why are you doing this, Dana? We, you know, you're supposed to be doing something about architecture. This doesn't have anything to do with architecture. And I'm really pleased to say that they're all designing ADUs now based on the legislation we wrote. But we started off thinking like, what can we give back to the community? This would have been a wonderful direction to go had we been able to convince the city council that there were conditions like alleys that could be re-greened, made safer if we populated them with secondary units. So we were proposing different ideas that both the individual property owner and the collective good might be benefited. We studied every type of lot, I think, in the entire city um, and then we built and studied the technology of uh, quick and easy building, recyclable building, really light building, uh, with this demonstration house that Kevin Daly Architects, someone I know well, um, designed with our architecture students at UCLA. We also went to all the neighborhood councils to see if we could um, find out what the source of their resistance was. And it turned out there wasn't that much resistance except in public statements. On the backside, everyone said to me, as after the you know, conversation ended, there would be a little line and people would say, how do I build one of these? How could I get one? Um, but in public, uh, it was a, a politically fraught conversation. Luckily, uh, Assemblyman Richard Bloom invited me to be a housing advisor. Uh, he then, uh, Jane Blumenfeld and I wrote the uh, ADU law, partnered with some colleagues in the Bay Area to make sure that the Bay Area housing stock would also be accommodated. They have different kinds of uh, backyards or houses, so it required a different law. And together we passed, and Richard Bloom carried, AB 2299, which opened up the 8.1 million and has actually spawned far more interesting legislation than the original legislation itself. And of course, um, has, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I, I often say, like if I died tomorrow, that could be written on my gravestone and it would be enough. <laughs> I hope I don't, but. Um, so a second principle or imperative is that we design generative demonstrations. And that means that rather than designing singular solutions, we always think of the work we do and the buildings we create as models or prototypes for other buildings. And we take an active stance to distribute that information. And you all know the Aravena or elemental half houses of Quintum and Roy, but they're a kind of ur case of creating a generative demonstration. So uh, in the um, 
Kingdom and Roy housing development, which is where there was already an informal settlement of people who then were awarded public housing. Um, they wanted to stay in that place because it was close to their jobs. It was where their social networks were, but the land was so expensive that Aravena developed an idea about building just half the house where the kitchen, bath, stairs, the hard to build and expensive to build pieces were. And the people who had already built their own housing would infill um, these new buildings with the uh, more open living space, bedrooms and living rooms. And it was very successful, as you can see in the photograph, and he carried that to other cities as well, and published all the drawings as open source records, all of that being a kind of generative demonstration. At City Lab, we've been looking at the kinds of housing where innovation might most likely lead to new demonstrations of uh, possibilities of accommodation, not just thinking of shelter beds or single family houses, but that stuff in between. And I'll just show you the most uh, successful example of that that we've undertaken, designed with Marta Novak, um, which is the Bruin Hub, <coughs> which we found at UCLA that though they guarantee 100% of the students' housing, um, there is a large proportion, excuse me. <coughs> is a large proportion of students who are commuters. And those commuters live off campus for a variety of reasons. Some of it is affordability, some of it is cultural, some of it's family, some of it's feeling alienated around the campus. And those commuters, half of them drive more than an hour to school. And I think if we could study that further, a quarter of them probably drive more than 90 minutes. And that means that they're in danger because they come in early in the morning and they don't leave until like midnight so that they can get home in the 20 minutes instead of the two hours that it would take if you left during traffic. All those studies suggested they needed a home away from home on campus. And so uh, we designed these pods to their requests and with a lot of um, joy and creative inspiration um, where they could study, sleep, and hang out during the day while they're on campus with a refrigerator and a microwave where they could cook. Um, this, they reserve those for a couple of hours during the day if you have a, on your Bruin card that you commute more than a certain distance. And you can stay overnight in these uh, pods during finals and midterms. We had expected that to happen all year round and met the fire marshals like, you know, surprise that anyone would think you could actually design a place, a piece of furniture where you could stay overnight. So. This is now spread to a second site on campus, uh, which is tied to the basic needs programs, which really came out of the pandemic. And the campus has plans to build a number of other Bruin hubs and um, other campuses, including USC student organizations have gotten in touch with us to figure out how they can do it. So I feel like this is another example of that kind of generative prototype or demonstration. Uh, so we're having a little trouble with the type going off, but I think you can imagine what that says, transformation at moments of crisis. Um, this is really where we find uh, both negative and positive things can happen. It's sort of Halliburton that steps in to solve some problems in moments of crisis. I think that there's a counter movement to that, whereas uh, people with real convictions and commitments for political purposes can also step in to counter that. Um, that that gives rise to the potential for transformative architectural solutions. And really, the Japanese uh, architects who came in at the end of the Great East Japan earthquake were a perfect demonstration of this. Um, the Japanese government, in a really laudable way, immediately found uh, emergency shelter accommodations for the some 200, 500,000 people who were displaced. Something like 20,000 people were killed on that single day of 311 in the tsunami and earthquake. Um, but what they'd learned in prior earthquakes, the Kobe earthquake in particular, was that emergency shelter only gave isolated dwelling for the people who were displaced. They lost their social networks, and many people died and committed suicide in these small houses and weren't discovered. Uh, it became a social phenomenon of dying alone that the uh, architects were trying to counteract. And they did that by providing these small homes for all. This was really led by Toyo Ito. Um, 
that were collective facilities within the emergency resettlement areas where uh, the only requirement was that 30 people could gather there. There would be a kitchen and some kind of outdoor space, and all the materials would be provided by volunteers and uh, built by volunteer labor. These were varied in the 29 or 30 different uh, settlement areas that they built them, some of them so well loved that after the people were permanently rehoused, they took their uh, homes for all apart and rebuilt them in their new settlements. And I think that's a kind of sign of how architecture stands in for something that's meaningful and socially critical to people's lives. You can see that these kind of examples of the homes for all address all of the three imperatives that I've been speaking about. So now I'm just going to show you what we're working on right now at City Lab, which is kind of the ev evolution of the work that I've been showing you. We found that the ADU laws couldn't guarantee affordability because they were all in private people's backyards. And as we know, a lot of those have ended up being pretty expensive. Uh, as we know, and most homeowners don't, um, costs the same to build in your backyard as in your front yard, and it might be even more expensive to build small. So we started looking at City Lab for public land where we could guarantee affordability. And the thing you see first when you're looking for open land in the California landscape are all our schools. There are 12,000 public schools in the state of California. In just the K through 12 schools, there's 150,000 acres of land. And 75,000 of that from our GIS analysis is underutilized, meaning it's not a school building, it's not an active play field, it's uh, not a parking lot even. It's land that could be used for housing. So why wasn't this happening already? It turned out that it had been happening and mi mainly in Los Angeles where four of five total uh, housing developments on school land had been built. We started partnering with the LASD people to figure out how they'd done it and working with the 84 different projects across the state that had been trying to do it to see what the barriers were. And again, working with Richard Bloom wrote legislation. This legislation, I think, might provide as much as 2 million units of housing if we reached its full potential um, to build uh, by right housing, no rezoning, up to three stories, no NIMBY resistance can make it less, well, in principle. Um, across the state. So uh, this is my closing slide just to bring you back to what the crisis is that we're dealing with here, how uh, I think in many ways we feel helpless in trying to solve the very problem that's right in our own discipline, the unhoused neighbors that we see every day right outside this building included. So how we begin to do that is by small gestures, what Ruha Benjamin calls viral justice actions. And I think all of us have that capacity in our own practices. This is my City Lab team. I never talk without showing them. Uh, it's an amazing group of young uh, students of color. We make a special point of bringing students uh, of color into our part of the UCLA architecture program to mentor them towards futures where City Lab itself becomes generative of a kind of new transition to a new practice in architecture. Thanks. So do we have time for